Welcome to the Network H2 webinar, Interim Findings from Hydrogen Research. My name is uh, Dr. Andy Smallbane. I'm an Associate Professor at Durham. We've organised this event through the EPSRC Network Plus, Network for a Hydrogen Fuel Transportation, which is a, a series of webinars which is looking at different aspects of hydrogen research related to the transportation sector. And this week, we're going to welcome two speakers who will present their interim findings from uh, small research projects we funded through the network. Now, because of the research nature of this research, we've asked, uh, we've asked each speaker to present for about or 20 to 5 to 30 minutes. The first presentation is actually from two people, Dr. Eni Oko from the University of Hull and Professor Edward Gobina from Robert Gordon University who will present on the development of a compact and highly efficient onboard ammonia cracking system produced to produce hydrogen in a hydrogen fueled long haul civil airliner. Dr. Oko is a process and energy systems engineer professionally recognized by the Council of Regulation and Engineering in Nigeria and an associate member of the ICME. And he's worked as a process engineer uh, in Nigeria before moving to the UK. And his expertise is on the application of process systems engineering for uh, energy systems design. Uh, and he's previously worked on projects funded by NERC, EPSRC, and uh, through Marie Curie. Uh, Professor Gobina has worked in the School of Engineering uh, at RGU since uh, 1998 and appointed as a reader in 2001 and became Professor of Chemical Engineering in 2005. And he's a senior fellow of higher education academy and he's been involved in three spin-outs um, and has supervised over 20 phd students and generated a range of patterns so i think any is going to present first and then he's going to hand over during that process uh, of the, the talk to thank you so much uh, my name is any oko and i'm a lecturer at the university of hall our project is looking at developing onboard ammonia cracking system this is very, very important for hydrogen fueled long haul civil airliners or transport systems in general. So this is um, a lineup of our team, uh, myself at the University of Hull. Um, my area of expertise is process systems engineering and uh, Dr. Alex Ibuhadon, also at the University of Hull, is a reader in catalysis and um, Professor Edward Gobina, who is um, an expert in membrane technology at Robert Gordon University, and Dr. Ianis Giannopoulos, who is an aircraft engineer and senior lecturer at uh, Cranfield University. So this is a very balanced team with different experts in various areas of our research. My presentation is to quickly introduce you to our project and some of the things that we are doing. My uh, partner, uh, uh, Professor Gobina, will then carry on with some testing that has been ongoing as part of the project. So I will talk, to, talk you through the background for our project, technology options, of course, trying to uh, give you all the backgrounds and motivation for our specific research. And then I will talk you through some of our activities and of course, highlight some of our results, conclusions, and their outputs so far from the project. So in terms of the background, of course, climate change mitigation is a subject that is not new to any of us here. And the fact that uh, as a response to climate change, uh, many countries, including the UK, have set uh, net zero targets for 2050. Um, while uh, this looks achievable from the point of view of implementing renewable energies, for instance, um, in the power generation sector. There are also hard to abate sectors that need uh, special intervention. One of such sectors is the transport sectors, especially long haul and uh, bulk transportation kind of, uh, which will include things like the train, the ships, airliners, trucks, etc. The other sector is uh, domestic heating. The domestic heating is also hard to decarbonize, especially in a place like the UK, although it is uh, um, geothermal heating, for instance, is very much pr praised in many quarters. 
you will find that uh, geothermal heating will fail you. Ground salt geothermal heating will fail you at the very time that you need it most, at the peak of winter. So at such times, you will still have to augment um, geothermal heating with gas heating. And this is where hydrogen could come in in the future. The other sector is the industrial sector. Some industrial sectors are hard to abate due to the singular way that they are set up. And one of such examples could be things like um, ammonia manufacturing, quite an irony. So um, because ammonia is very, very critical for the survival of humanity, taking out carbon completely out of ammonia is quite challenging. And again, this is where hydrogen could come in. Then lastly is the power sector. The power sector, while it looks like, okay, for instance, it's going to expand the wind, wind power capacity, you will find that due to their intermittent nature, that you still you are still going to require fast fired power applications that will be there on standby to ensure that the grid is stable at all times. So these are hard to abate sectors as it is, and they, they require um, special interventions. Hydrogen is recognized to be important to decarbonize these sectors. Part of the reason being that if you look at the, the chart here, you will see that in terms of gravi gravimetric density, that hydrogen even have a better attributes than conventional fuels. Although the volumetric density in terms of energy is much lower, but in terms of gravimetric density, it's actually very good. Okay, based on that realization, you now have the hydrogen strategy in the UK and the EU. And uh, this strategy is focused on mostly scaling green and blue hydrogen, which is like the sort of hydrogen sources that are clean and does not create any other extra pressure on the environment. However, although hydrogen is widely praised of all these prospects, there is a problem with hydrogen storage. One of them is safety. Um, it's uh, well established that hydrogen have greater explosion risk compared to conventional sources. The other point is gas transporting hydrogen in the gas phase requires high pressure that could be up to 700 bar in some applications. And that brings in additional risk. Also, the storage volume is also very high, comparatively around four times. In the liquid phase, you will require cryogenic temperature as low as uh, minus 253 degrees C. Again, that is uh, expensive, uh, expensive and brings in additional risk. Also, it's very complicated. And if hydrogen is transported and stored in liquid phase, refueling for transport sector applications, you could have uh, long refueling times, you know. And then, of course, the storage volume is also higher. And this is the reason why, as far as hydrogen is concerned, new and better methods for storing and transporting hydrogen must be developed. Regarding technologies for storing and uh, transporting hydrogen, one of such methods is uh, through adsorption in materials like zeolite or metal organic uh, frameworks. However, um, as of today, the best state-of-the-art adsorbent for hydrogen storage still operates at very low temperature. And the worst of all is that they have uh, low um, H2 capacity. So unless there are some breakthrough in, in uh, invention, in development, regarding physical storage is, is quite difficult at the moment. The other option is chemical storage by converting hydrogen to compounds such as ammonia, uh, metal halides, or methanol. In examining the various options, we we'll find that ammonia exceeds the performance of any known media for hydrogen transport in so many ways. One is that ammonia have a high storage capacity um, around 17.65 weight percent. The other point is that ammonia also have high volumetric hydrogen density. Ammonia can also be stored at mild conditions uh, around 10 bar and 25 degrees C, you have liquid ammonia. And then the other thing that goes for ammonia is that ammonia transport and storage is a very much uh, traditional uh, practice in the industry with, with many, many years of experience in transporting and storing ammonia. So that makes ammonia a natural choice when you come to examining various media for um, hydrogen transport. So um, if you are going to use ammonia as a, a hydrogen carrier, that means that you have to crack ammonia at the point of use. 
And different ways to do that, we can do that through catalytic cracking. And catalytic cracking will naturally operate between temperatures of 450 to 900 degrees C, depending on the specific catalyst in use. And of course, you can also use flexible, it's also flexible and uses cheap catalysts, and it's also relatively mature. The other technology is through the electrochemical decomposition route, operates at lower temperatures. However, they use a very expensive rare earth metal catalyst. And then the other point is that it's also very early stage and uh, pretty much at proof of concept stage with lots of questions yet to be um, addressed. So going forward, on this basis, uh, through very thorough literature review, we have established to progress with the thermal cracking route. The thermal cracking route, in theory, have potential for onboard application. Um, and this is what our research is about, really looking at how the thermal tracking system can be deployed on board, because we've established that it's difficult to transport and carry hydrogen in any form, liquid or gas. It's, it's very challenging. And ammonia offers a solution. So one of the things our research is looking at is to explore all the potentials, all the difficulties, and identify possible solutions going forward. We've also found from some calculations that catalysts operating under 400 degrees will be highly favorable for this. Part of the reasons being a longer lifespan for the catalyst and, of course, reduced energy consumption. So going forward, we here are some of our objectives to develop and assess a new onboard ammonia catalytic cracking system and also analyze ammonia storage requirements in a typical airliner, namely ABOS A380. Here are some activities, ongoing activities and completed activities. We've done extensive review of catalysts for ammonia cracking. Um, we have a review paper on that that should be coming out. Uh, we should be submitting very soon. We've also, we have some new catalyst developments ongoing using computational techniques. And we've done some modeling um, for plug flow reactors and we've also done some ammonia storage assessment for a typical A380. And then testing of catalytic membrane uh, reactor is also ongoing within the project. So here is a sample model that we have uh, developed for a plug flow reactor for ammonia tracking uh, using lithium amide uh, catalyst and using a rate equation derived from actual experiments. One of the key things that we'll find is that the conversion for this system declines rapidly as you go through as it goes through the reactor. This points out the equilibrium limitation for this reaction, which, in, which shows that hydrogen recombines quickly with uh, nitrogen to form ammonia, you know, as quickly as they are formed. And this makes case for a membrane reactor that is able to isolate hydrogen as, as soon as it is formed. This is part of the reason that developing a membrane reactor system is a very key aspect of our project. Then here is some analysis for um, an A380 that have also been done um, by the project team led by Ianis. And part of the things we have found here is that compared to jet A4, that the liquid ammonia in weight ratio is around 1.98, okay, which means increases the weight of the aircraft. And also in terms of volume, it's also more by 2.65. Here are some conclusions, preliminary conclusions. Uh, first of all, new catalyst de development, especially catalyst support. So most of our work is, is looking at catalyst focus. It's very, very important for progressing thermal tracking to um, commercial status. The other point is that catalyst, uh, catalytic membrane reactors is required to achieve, to achieve the desired conversion as this uh, reaction is strongly um, equilibrium limited. Then lastly, uh, several airliners as they are currently will have to be redesigned to accommodate um, this sort of uh, proposed technology, you know, based on the weight ratio and the, the volume ratio for the system. Then uh, output so far, we've had two, uh, we have, we have had one conference presentation. We've had one accepted. Um, uh, the presentation is going to be sometimes in June. Our paper has been accepted for oral presentation. And then we'll have a journal paper that uh, will be submitted very soon. Thank you. Uh, I want to then kindly call um, Edward to start his presentation. Okay, so my part of the project uh, is to develop a catalytic membrane reactor for high purity hydrogen. 
uh, that is suitable for polymer electrolyte membrane full cells uh, adapted for long haul passenger aircraft transportation. I'm uh, leading the Center of Excellence for Process Integration and Membrane Technology. My name is Edward Gobina. I'm, I'm a full uh, UK professor of chemical engineering at the School of Engineering. So you now know the all the uh, partners of the project. I won't go into that again. So this is our university, Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. It's at Gardi campus. And we are this say and wood building just here with the tower, which is the library. And this is just a snip through the laboratories of the center, uh, which is a typical process and uh, uh, membrane system laboratory. Thing, or the three key things that we'll be looking at in terms of energy transition or zero carbon emissions economy uh, to achieve first dramatic improvements in energy productivity, final uh, primary energy mix by 2050, uh, massive investments will be needed and there will be transition challenges as any has just said, there might be need for the role of offsets to enable that transition to happen. Why is ammonia important and why green ammonia is important? 1% of the world's total energy supply is used in the Haber-Bosch process for making ammonia. That total accounts for roughly 1% of global annual CO2 emissions. And that is more than any other industrial chemical making reaction. The global aviation sector accounted for about 3.2% of global carbon emissions just the year before COVID-19, which is about 2018, 2019, after almost doubling since 2000. So that is more than 1.6 billion metric tons of carbon emissions. So just by looking at that, if we develop widespread use of green ammonia, then we can save about 1.32 gigatons of CO2. I thought of uh, this presentation and I said that probably there's a lot of uh, people don't know that this is not the first energy transition that we are having. We had the first energy transition from wood to coal and then from coal to oil and then natural gas came in and this is a new one that is going to take us to green hydrogen or a green future. So in that transition from wood to green hydrogen, we are seeing that the amount of hydrogen in each stage is increasing while the amount of carbon is decreasing. You can see that clearly here where you start with your uh, conventional generator with uh, very low efficiency and it's noisy and dirty and we are going to full cell generators with uh, onboard reforming, uh, increasing the efficiency to about 30 to 49%. It's quiet and clean, but if we incorporate renewable energy, then that takes the efficiency to about 60 to 85%. And there's no noise, very clean. And in that uh, a transition, we are now beginning to see different colors of hydrogen. Gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, turquoise hydrogen, and green hydrogen. So that is good news because when we have green hydrogen, of course, there won't be any pollution. And in that transition, hydrogen will be key but don't forget that to produce ammonia, you need nitrogen. And that nitrogen has to be produced in a green fashion to make that transition truly zero carbon. And these are the sorts of sectors that we are trying to work at, the transportation sector. Some people are thinking of trees. Trees absorb carbon dioxide, but how many trees can you plant? Because we are competing with 
uh, human human settlement also don't forget there are some arguments that we can use municipal waste agricultural waste uh, forest waste but uh, you can only get so much for uh, air transportation so global ammonia production is about 100 million metric tons today and china is number one at 44,000. If you look at the global population, you see that the global population will exceed 10 billion by 2050. On the right, if you look at the arable land that is available worldwide, you see that it's decreasing rapidly. So if you combine those two things, you see where the human population on earth is at currently. It's a terrible predicament. If you look at fertilizer production, phosphorus and potassium are declining or stabilizing while ammonia is on the rise. So there is a competing factor there between utilization of fertilizer, uh, uh, ammonia as a fertilizer, and ammonia as a chemical constituent or energy storage medium. And you can see the growth of ammonia tend to compounded annual growth rate of about 10 to 18%. That is quite huge for a large uh, global commodity chemical. Interestingly, the Haber-Bosch process was introduced or invented in 1913, and the global population at that time was less than 2 billion. Immediately after it was commercialized, you can see the population just exploded. By the time we reach 10 billion, the amount of ammonia that will be needed will be very significant. So between 1913 and today, about three out of every five people on air are existing because of the Haber-Bosch process. But the Haber-Bosch process is very energy intensive and produces a lot of CO2. So what is the concept of our net zero long haul air transportation? We've seen our consortium. So I'm concentrating, RGU is concentrating on the membrane system. So the Haber-Bosch process today, as I said, is highly energy intensive, produces a lot of CO2. We also have technology using membrane technology, uh, membrane systems to capture CO2. And if you capture CO2 from that, you might convert your hydrogen to blue hydrogen. Uh, if you integrate renewable energy using water electrolysis, of course, you generate your green hydrogen and hence green ammonia. So that is our ABOS 380 and it's designed to carry 853 passengers. It's a wide bodied aircraft and at times, it's very awesome when you actually see it physically. And it took Airbus some 9.5 billion to actually get the program, Airbus uh, 380 program up and running. And that was in 19 uh, December 2000. So if you look at our aircraft, if you concentrate on uh, number seven, Number seven are the wings, left and right wings. And uh, that is important because we don't want to alter the design of the aircraft so much so that people become afraid of, taking, of, of, of flying. You have to give them the assurance that everything is okay. And what, they, they, what they've known before will not change significantly. So look at number seven. Number seven are the wings. And that is where we store our fuel. Uh, we are not today trying to develop a supersonic stratospheric aircraft. We're still looking at passenger aircraft that is about 35,000 feet. So if you look at the fuel, how the fuel is uh, loaded into our aircraft, we see the wings, and then there's also a central fuel tank. So we want to maintain that uh, configuration. As, as Annie has uh, said in his presentation, 
ammonia can be stored conveniently at room temperature and about minus 10 degrees uh, centigrade. So it, it is a liquid that can easily be accommodated in an aircraft. And in terms of refueling, there are two ways you can use trucking system or a hydrant dispenser system. And uh, ammonia fits into that because you can you can easily store ammonia at the at the at room temperature and as a liquid. And so you can still maintain your airport infrastructure without totally dismantling what is currently being used. And that is just the market storage and transportation of ammonia. We know that ammonia is currently being stored, no problem. Ammonia can also be used for power. Uh, and you can then, by cracking, utilize it uh, in your car as a fuel uh, because you can convert it to hydrogen. But conversion, converting ammonia to hydrogen is not straightforward because the reaction is reversible. Once nitrogen and hydrogen are formed, they react because of equilibrium to give you back your ammonia. So once equilibrium has been attained, there's very little that you can do. So this is our process. You store your ammonia on board as a liquid. You pass it through a heat exchanger. It goes through your reactor where the cracking occurs. Because of equilibrium, you will not crack all the ammonia. There will still be some of it left, which you recycle. And your hydrogen uh, and nitrogen sent to your reactor membrane system. So the membrane system is the key because that is where your hydrogen and nitrogen will be separated to produce your pure hydrogen that goes to feed your polymer electrolyte full cells. Uh, if there's any unconverted hydrogen, it is recycled. So how do we get the hydrogen separation? So we used what they call a palladium membrane or palladium and silver membrane, which we prepared by electrolyte plating of a thin film, about six micron thick on a porous structure. So we used a porous ceramic structure to, because palladium, it is known, allows only hydrogen, but it can only do that if it is dense. And I will show you results that we've obtained that confirm that our membranes are dense and they can allow only hydrogen. So we used an electrolyte splitting technique and that is just a schematic of it. We have an alumina support, which is porous, highly porous. And we put it inside a plating solution and we do a lot of, a few tricks on it to make sure that the palladium is deposited on the surface outside surface of the tube. We can also do inside tube deposition. We can also do use a vacuum, electrode deposition using a vacuum. So by creating a vacuum, you can enhance the, the integrity of the thin film. And this is just typical. If you want to use pure palladium, those are the sort of conditions that you would uh, you need to, to be present in your bath. You can also do palladium 75, silver 25, whichever composition that you want. Once we've done that, we need to analyze the quality of the membranes. We use uh, methods like scanning electron microscopy, energy dispersive uh, X-ray. And also we take samples from the bath to make sure that and analyze them to make sure to know how much palladium or how much silver has been deposited on our fins. And then of course, we manipulate the temperature and some experimental conditions to give us the right deposition rate. And these are just examples. That's a membrane inside the, the top left hand corner. It's a membrane inside the furnace uh, oven that we, we use it, we use a furnace to remove any surface debris that might uh, have accumulated onto the membrane surface. Then we sensitize the surface so that it will be able to, uh, to be activated. And then 
and also so that it will be able to accept the palladium. And then we use distilled water to wash the surface and then we dip it, as you see in the right hand side at the top, we dip it into our solution for a, a, a deposition. At the bottom on the right hand side, you see two membranes. The one at the top is the support without any deposition. And the one at the bottom, you see a thin film of palladium that has been coated. And we put that in a shell and tube a heat exchanger like system. And we pass gas through to see what has changed in the membrane before the position and after the position. At the bottom of that slide, you see the sort of membrane system that we are using. They are heated and we can make any size depending on the configuration that you you want to use, but mostly we use tubular supports and then and the reactor has inlets. It's a shell and tube type configuration. So you have inlets and outlets in the tube and shell side. You can put your pressure gauges and whatever, uh, like you see in the middle, we have a heating jacket with thermocouple so that we can measure the temperature and so on. So this is a plot of the permeance or the amount of gas that is flowing through or uh, the membrane uh, such as uh, measured in the flux. It's a molar flux per unit pressure and that is the inlet pressure. As you see for the membrane, uh, for the support membrane, you can see there that uh, helium gas passes through the membrane uninhibited because there's no coating on it. However, when we've deposited the palladium, that's what we get for the same, under the same conditions. You see that the helium uh, permeance is almost zero. It's very insignificant. And that shows to us, coupled with the scanning electron microscopy that we do, it indicates to us that we have achieved a very dense film. And with scanning electron microscopy, you can actually see the film uh, on the surface of the membrane. So you can see the effect of temperature and activation energies. And that is the palladium membrane. And you can see the hydrogen uh, going through. And just to finish, if you combine the reaction and the separation, that's what you get. So your yeah, ammonia comes in, decomposed by a catalyst and allows the hydrogen to go through. So you've now combined the reaction and the separation. So you get a compact system. Okay, that is the end of my talk. Because I also saw that some comments rising up on the on the, on the comments uh, part um so, so as as we proceed with, with the study in Cranfield we, we we found out that you cannot actually store uh, uh liquid ammonia under 10 bar pressure on the wings so so an alternative kind of fuel storage is is suggested plus uh the, the Cranfield so far the Cranfield study has shown that there is going to be a payload range kind of, of reduction if you're going for, for liquid hydrogen ammonia. Of course, th this, is, this is not complete yet, just, just because uh, Professor Gobina uh, showed the, the initial idea of, of, of storing uh, uh, liquid ammonia in the wings. We just said that this is, this is not going to be applicable. There must be another way of storing liquid ammonia in the aircraft. And even by doing so, there's going to be implications on the payload range diagram. That's all. Okay. Thank so you. We'll, we'll keep the questions until after the second, well, the second topic.